All right, guys. So welcome, everyone. Happy Friday. We are joined today by two amazing people from Shift Success. They are clients and friends of Shift Success. Uh, they've been with us uh, for a little while, and they're going to be sharing their stories on, you know, join the police, how they met to build in this phenomenal business that they've got today. Uh, welcome, Stacey and David. How are you both? Hello. Hello. Good. Yeah, thank, you. good thank you. Yes, good. Good stuff. Good stuff. So first, of all, I want to start off and we're going to get into the juicy stuff around business and what you're doing in that. Um, but I first want to kind of start off with um, yourself, David. I believe you're ex-military. Um, is that right? Yes, I am. Yeah. So okay. I served in the military for um, just shy of five years um, in the Royal Welsh Light Infantry Battalion. Right. OK. And what, what kind of like I don't know anything about the military. So what kind <laughs> of things did you like do in there? Like, was it did you ever go to combat? Was you just training for combat? What was it like? Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to do um, any combat tours, i.e. Afghan or Iraq. Um, whether that's a good or a bad thing, obviously, that's what we initially trained to do. However, um, obviously, seeing the detrimental effect is had on friends of mine. Um, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Yes, I would have liked to do it, but I'm also glad that I didn't in the respect of I haven't got some of the issues that they're sadly facing. Um, but yeah, we did a lot of stuff abroad, practicing and, and obviously getting honed in on our skills for that, uh, should that come up. But no, I didn't see any combat tours. I did um, a few stints over in Canada, Poland, Germany, Cyprus, um, and just a few bits and bobs. Wow. How old were you when you first joined the military? Uh, I was around 21. So I joined wow. November uh, 2011, I think it was. Wow. Okay. And what kind of like is that like a, a masculine urge to join the military? What was it for you? Like uh, it was quite peculiar, actually. So at the time, I was working at Amazon, um, and with Amazon, they always have an influx of Christmas staff, and then they lay the majority off. I was one of the lucky ones. Um, and without blowing my own trumpet, I was good at what I did there. So I was one of the top assemblers and stuff. Um, so I had good stats. So I kept my job where about three thousand people every year got laid off. However, as you can imagine, Amazon drops off massively in January. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, you tend to find you'll go in, they'll send you straight home, you take annual leave because they haven't physically got enough work for you. So okay. me and at the time, it was my sister's boyfriend um, who had been yeah. medically discharged from the military and we were discussing it. And I said, oh, it's always something I'd want to do. I had a long term view of being in the police, but it's always something I wanted to do. Um, one, just to have that itch scratched and more for life experience for the police because I knew I had nothing to offer them so mm. we literally went in on the Monday morning one week and I said to his name was David as well funny enough on the way in I said this is going to be my decider if I walk into Amazon warehouse now and I am out the door on annual leave by 10 a.m we started at seven I said the next stop before I even go home I'm going to the army careers office and that is going to be my decider so he was like, right, OK, we walked in. I walked down the stairs. I clocked in at 7 a.m. I turned around to be met by my manager who said, clock straight back out. We've got absolutely nothing for you. So I was like, wow. so clocked out. And by quarter to eight, I was sat outside the Army Careers office in Swansea, where I used to live with a Costa coffee. As soon as it opened, I signed up and that was it. I was on the road to that and that was it. Wow. So wow. Had I stayed on, had I... Had I stayed on in that day, I never would have joined the army. That's as literally as clear cut as it was. Wow. Wow. And kind of when, <laughs> when you turn up in the, you know, it's like a like a career office for the yeah. army. Yeah. They get to know you. You've got to do some certain tests to get in. Is that right? Yeah. So it was initial discussion as about what route you wanted to go down in the army, whether you wanted to branch off into a trade like engineers. For me, Personally, I don't know if it's just like that macho element, but it's just when I think of army, I think of frontline soldier guns and that's that's the army in my perspective. Yeah. Uh, so that's all I ever wanted to do. Um, and it was just a case of you had to do pre-fitness uh, tests. Then you went away for a two day pre-selection where you stayed away. And yeah. then you basically had to do what they call a barb test at the time, um, mm. which was an exam. Then based on that, they will tell you what you are eligible to apply for. Infantry is obviously quite low entry anyway um but i had to do all that and then it was a case of waiting to go on selection you were given three choices of role in the army so if you weren't successful with infantry anything else you wanted to do and i literally brought infantry in all three because that was the only thing i was ever going to do um and yeah wow. they from there, and then i started my selection in catrick then wow amazing amazing stuff and stacy what did you do before the police you can tell why he does all our business videos <laughs> 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 um so mine was just no, not exciting 
exciting at all. Mm -hmm. So I was a debt collector for a mortgage company before joining oh. the police. Wow. Uh, I've always been office based, really. There was a couple of home visits, um, just going through people's income, expenditure, debts and, and things like that, really. Um, yes. Yeah, bog standard until I joined the police. And then yeah. just like, God, wow. taking 999 calls and just speaking to people in their like worst moments. Like, yeah, I can imagine that's going to take its toll. With with the debt collecting, like, were, were you going around people's houses? Like, um, or... no, <laughs> right, <laughs> no okay. it's all over the phone. There right. was a couple of home visits. Yeah. Um, like I said, I'd sit down and discuss income, expenditure, um, what they can afford, and things like that. But it was mostly sort of credit control arrears management in an office environment. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So nothing and then you, spectacular for me. <laughs> and then you decide to join this. What attracted you to the police, Stacey? Um, I don't really know, to be honest. Obviously, the, the money was better, but it wasn't all about that. I think it was just, I was bored. Mm. Um, it was just boredom. You know, it was day in, day out, mundane. Mm. You know, it, yeah. it wasn't a very nice role to be in. You were always shouted at um, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, that, yeah. that's it, really. And when you, when you, because you joined the police in control room, right? Um, yeah. So usually you're a dispatcher. Is that, is that right? Or? Yeah. Well, both. I did call handling and dispatching. So it was like a dual role. Um. Right. So it depends. When I went in one day, it was my manager decides where I was. But right. generally I was dispatching most of the time. And what did you prefer? Dispatching, definitely. Right. Okay. I, and I'm assuming is that because you, you know, on the other side of that, that's to do with like the public, but the dispatching's to do with the cops. Is that right? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. Got you. Got you. Yeah. A lot of people don't talk about. I know, you know, we work with exo police officers, police staff as well, and police staff. Um, but sometimes you, you know, like, I don't know if it's forgotten or or what, because police officers are kind of the main focus, really. But I feel like you know, dealing with the calls you deal with under the most stressful situations when typically you are helpless in that because you're on the phone yeah. like how how did you manage with that because there's gonna be people screaming or people who are being attacked and you're speaking to them and you've got to remain calm and you know you know really straight level thinking how do you deal with that emotion when are you trained for that or not really I, it was a massive eye-opener when I first started um I found it difficult because I couldn't actually see what was going on mm. um, I know, obviously, four cops on the front line is is um you it's much worse because you can actually see it. But mm. when you're speaking to, say, for instance, a child, mm. he can't explain what's going on. I spoke to one child and he was saying there's blood everywhere. Jesus. Uh, he was literally four or five years old, and I just had this image in my head. Yeah, it was nothing. <laughs> when the police actually got there, it was nothing like what he had described. Yeah. And but not getting the closure as well. So it's just on to the next. So you send the cops, they go there, on mm. to the next. They never know, you know, what's happened in the end. Right. So you don't know about the outcome. So like like something could have happened like chaos, <laughs> but you don't know actually what's the end result. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So you've almost got, got to really detach yourself from every single thing yeah, that you definitely. deal with. I have, I have become quite detached as well. I think you have to. This yeah. is the in the police, isn't it? You have you, to become detached. Do you find yourself in that role, Stacey, that, you know, and we'll go on to, uh, you know, David a second being a police officer, but with yourself, Stacey, do you feel like you take a bit home with you as well in terms of, oh, Jesus, that was a that was a bad call tonight kind of thing or, or um, not? I do. You, I think you? over the years now, I've just learned to leave it at the door. Unless it's something involving kids or animals, I find. Mm, yeah. Um, but generally, I don't, I seem to detach myself now. That's good. You just learn it over the years, don't you? Initially, when I first started, the first six months, it was horrendous. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. And, and, and David, obviously, you know, you joined the police. Um, what was kind of that first, you know, experience like the first six months being in the police for you? Um, it, again, it was a massive eye opener um, because I think we just assume that everyone lives to the same standard of us. Um, and like Stace has touched on, especially with children, we were going into houses where kids were sleeping on mattresses without beds they were dirty and that was a massive eye-opener for me thinking that people live in this way it was really upsetting and it, again like Stacey said um I think we have a 
I think it's better for us as cops because we have that closure. The mm. amount of times me and Stace discussed it and like I said, she'll hear traumatic stuff over the phone when it's live and it's at their worst moment. When we turn up, it's all done and dusted most of the time and very rarely we actually witness anything. So I would probably say it's less traumatic for us. Obviously, there's some certain live instance we stumble across, which is obviously traumatic. But um, yeah, for me, it was just a massive eye-opener more than anything about how the other half live almost. And I, I that's not me putting myself on a pedestal, do you know I mean? But it's just, yeah, I don't I don't think I was prepared as much for that. Um, and just as much as I hate to say it, about how horrible the human race can be to each other. Um, yeah. You know, things that people do to each other, I just think, oh, I couldn't imagine doing that to another human being or inflicting that injury or whatever the case may be. Yes. So I think that was another eye-opener that I've probably not experienced. I had a lot of life experience from the military, but it's just a different sort of life experience that you get from dealing with people in the police who have just, unfortunately, we just deal with people that are genuinely evil. It's not, you know, yeah. uh, and sadly, that is the fact of life that I had to learn. It is is sad in what, you know, what you're saying. It's like you see the bad side of human beings and for a lot of people you know out there like you know joe public and people outside the police they they sometimes see the bad but they're not the evil the the really bad stuff and i think more so they probably see a lot more kindness i mean you know i've worked in custody I, i've seen terrible people uh come into custody especially when they're angry and you guys bring them in for me to deal with um but essentially um that contrast is quite stark like in custody or the police compared to actually being out there in, in, in the public away from the police is, is, is a massive, massive contrast. It's something that I've noticed for sure. And sometimes that can build up a bit of cynicism, um, negativity and cynical cynicalism and, you know, a bit of pessimism around people. And we always, we almost like expect people to be bad. And that expectation doesn't do as good. I don't think it's like, Oh, this guy's being nice to me. He must be a, an evil guy somewhere. He's going to come out any minute. He's going to be evil, but actually he just might be a nice guy, but you've been in the police for so long and that kind of, that's coming up. Do, do you find that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot which falls by the wayside is obviously the perception of police at the minute, we all know it isn't great. Um, but I think obviously doing the job firsthand, I think a lot of things that are forgotten about is that we don't just deal with crime. You know, people slay and hate the police. That's fine. They've got their own personal issues with the police. But, you know, they have to remember that that police officer may be the first person turning up to a child in a cardiac arrest. They may have saved someone's life. I've had personally some quite serious incidents that didn't involve crime. I grabbed a woman on a bridge who nearly took me over the bridge with her and nearly ended my life before it would have ended hers. Um, mm -hmm. And things like that, people are quick to judge the police, okay? Um, and, and this isn't me trying to promote the police in any way. I'm just saying it's such a mixed bag that the police deal with now. I mm -hmm. think a lot of it falls by the wayside that we don't just deal with crime. Um, yeah. And it's hard, like I say, that, about that bridge incident. Like, I was nearly dragged over that bridge trying to save someone's life. And within less than 20 minutes, I was at a domestic separating two people fighting. So that wow. just goes to show the contrast. Didn't have time to, like, process that. It was straight into arresting an angry male. Mm. So it just shows the diversity of the role and how quickly you have to adapt mentally more than probably physically. Yeah, complete. Yeah, I, a lot of people just don't have that. Like, if you're not working in the police, they, they don't have that perception at all. I think, you know, a lot of people out there who do have an issue with the police they obviously see the the, the uniform and not the human in yeah. the uniform and they they look at that rather than you know david who's got his own personal life you know kids and so forth and his own hobbies uh they just kind of the hatred towards the uniform so um yeah which is sad but it's the reality we live in unfortunately and, and sometimes you know a big thing that i don't agree is the news where you, you'll always see like you know if a police officer does make a mistake which you know the humans that will be everywhere that will be everywhere the world will know about it right but if you see like you know a police officer do something really amazing like it, it might come up in one or two ways but it, it's gone very quickly yeah. and I, I just find that again it's like a propaganda against police officers which is a frustration again to do the uniform right yeah yeah and i think that is a lot a part of it that I have to sort of take on board because obviously coming from the military, which 99% of the time is well respected, especially mm. out of the UK. When we used to go to Canada, mm. you walk past people and they would literally stand at a salute while you walk past them in the airport. So to go from that to putting on a different uniform and have people physically spit on me yeah. was a 
massive mental challenge that I had to overcome and realize that they don't have the respect military do. Mm -hmm. But once I got past the fact that they're just targeting the uniform or the authority, it made it a lot easier. But it's still not nice, obviously, being spat on or bitten, which I have been. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I completely agree. So something more nice now, more positive. <laughs> I want to talk about you two, you and, and your relationship. So in my head, I don't know if this is true. Was it like, you know, Stacey, you took this call from this deep <laughs> Welsh accent and it's like, oh, that's a nice voice. <laughs> and then, yeah. oh, you know, you've got a nice voice too. Was it like that on the radio? You know, how did you two meet? This is not a nice accent. <laughs> <so no. laughs> absolutely not. Yeah. All right. We did but... meeting work, yeah. um, but it was through a group of friends. Um, so we knew each other for years before we actually... Yeah entered into a relationship and um, we're in the same friend circle and in the police it's kind of like you know a family really <laughs> it is yeah yeah literally um just live with each other basically <laughs> so we were literally just spending more time together than we were at home um yeah so it was friendship first wasn't it and then yeah. it's just yeah, it's stayed from there, the same really. relief so yeah we were both shift. on what we would call sea relief so um when it was quiet on nights, we would obviously pop up. Um, one of the other girls that worked with Stace would make cakes and we'd call in for cakes and stuff like that. So it was just a case of getting to know each other. Um, and yeah, it just grew from there, really, like Stace said. Nice, nice. Short and sweet, that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> short and sweet. Um, so, guys, how long have... Uh, David, how long have you been the police in total now? Uh, so I joined September 2016, so about seven and a half, coming okay. up to seven, eight years. Right. And, and Stacey, how long have you been in the police? Uh, well, I've been in a control room environment nine years, but I actually left the police this year um, for a council based job, yeah. which is yeah. much less stress. Yeah, I can um, imagine. But yeah, still, it's still a control room environment. It's still the same sort of stuff. <laughs> cool. Awesome. OK. And for you guys, uh, you know, I, I know this, but I think it will help a lot of people watching and who's going to listen to back on the podcast. But you know, you've got this career in the police. We've talked about some of the challenges that obviously police officers face and obviously in the control room as well. Um, but what made you, what are the real reasons that encourage you to start looking, you know, at building your own business um, whilst in the police? It was actually David that um, stalked your Facebook <laughs> initially and he came up with the idea. I'd never even thought about going into business. It never crossed my mind. Um I, I think it was because, I don't know, I just thought maybe, maybe I didn't lack, I lack the skills to mm -hmm. be a business owner, maybe, um, that I didn't really have. I mean, I've got a few qualifications, but nothing major, you know, no degrees or anything like that. And it's just literally never crossed my mind. I've always worked for the man mm -hmm. um, and just gone on from job to job and just floated on by, really, um, until David suggested it. Um, it's, I suddenly just thought, yeah, we can do this. Oh, um, I love that. So, yeah. Very supportive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you won't believe like, a lot of people out there, unfortunately, um, they're like, one wants to go in business or wants to do something, wherever that something may be, but the other one's like, ooh, hold your horses. <laughs> hold your horses. And, and unfortunately, it's like, you're going to live in resentment of each other. If you grow old together, and you're like, well, I could have done this, but you stopped me. You just don't want that dynamic. So it's really good to see that you obviously uh, both support of each other. But for you, David, like what encouraged you to start looking at business? Um, so there were several factors for me. Mine was a lot more emotionally driven. So um, I, up until the last 12 months, I've been on a response role in the police. I was drowning in work. I was extremely unhappy and I was going to work absolutely hating the role. And I always said, if I ever get to the point where I hate the role, then I'm going to do something about it, whether that's change my role in the job or look elsewhere, whatever the case may be, because I don't want to be one of those who just goes to calls, just full of resentment, hate the job. Um, so that was a little bit of the factor. Um, there was some personal issues where my son came to live with me. So um, that was another driving factor of me wanting a better lifestyle rather than working nights, being knackered and just having to abide by this six on four off pattern. So that was another thing. And from previous, I got into a lot of money worries with um like I got into bad debt when I was in the military. I was a bit silly with money. I was young. I was stupid. Yeah. Um, and that really had a massive impact on me. Even when the early days of me and Stace getting together, Stace will tell you, I used to wake up four or five o'clock in the morning. And the first thing I would do the minute I wake up, look at my phone, look at my bank to see how overdrawn I was when the bills had come out. It, wow. it would stop me sleeping. It would fill me with dread getting up in the mornings. And I was, Stace will tell you, I was a horrible person to be around. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And I just remember seeing the stalker group like we're on now and thinking, I'll do it one day. I'll sort it one day. And then one day it just got too much. And I just thought, right, I'm going to go for it. We've got the money there now. We'll just go for it. And I remember speaking to Stace and I was almost fighting back the tears when I spoke to Stacey on my audition call, which means I knew that something had to change. Um, yeah, and that was just it. And, I, and obviously when Dylan came to live with me, then that was just the driving factor, right? It's, it's almost like fate making the decision for me now. I'm going to drive this forward as best I can. If it comes to nothing, at least I can sit there and say, I tried rather than sit there saying, oh, well, I should have done it or I didn't do it because I can at least say I've done it. It didn't work. And I can put it to the back of my mind and carry on without having any doubts or regret almost. Wow. What a story. I love that. So, I mean, I can't imagine, but the, like the crippling, like I've in my younger days too, you know, I've been in situations where, you know, I've spent all my life savings and, you know, credit cards to pay for certain things. And I actually, uh, you know, I mentioned this the other day and the founder of the company still talks about this to for his own company, but I threw up, I actually got sick when, uh, in the toilets after I spent that money. And um, if you've not been in that situation, it's hard. Anxiety is crippling. Your, your, um, your appetite goes, you're not a nice person to be around because you're on the edge all the time. But for you, David, like, you know, going through that and still taking action to actually, you know, better your life, you know, because I've, you know, worked with hundreds of, you know, excellent and police officers and people beyond the police. There's kind of two categories. I've mentioned this before as well, but it's like people out there who will go, right, I'm financially broke. So that means I can't do anything. But then there's people like you who have obviously gone, right, I'm really struggling financially right now. That's the reason why I have to go and start something or build a business to actually accelerate my income same with parents parents will sometimes go oh, i can't start a business i've got kids yeah. and i'm like that is the I, I hate that excuse your your yeah. kids should be the reason why you want to build a business you want to leave a legacy make their world a better place be a better role model right so i, I just love the mindset that you have the attitude you have in changing your situation um and and Stacey, you know, I'm you know as a partner, you know, obviously of David going through that, I can't imagine how hard that was for you as well. And um, it was yeah, extremely hard. Um, like he said, I would wake up in the middle of the night, he'd be on his phone checking his bank account. Wow. And just almost in tears at some point. Um, yeah. And come the first of the month when the bills were coming out, it was almost certain that he wouldn't be sleeping that night. Jesus Christ. I know. I'd have to take his watch off him because it would be buzzing when each direct debit was coming out, waking yeah. him up. And yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't a good, great time. But that emotion it. is what has driven me to do it. I never, ever want to ever feel like that again. So every time I even doubt myself now, I just think back like where I am now to how I was then. Yeah. And I, I know for a fact, whatever happens, I will never, ever put myself in that position. And it was again. difficult it was for me to understand, really, I think. Yeah. So it could have gone one or two ways. ways. Mm. I mean, we weren't going to break up or anything, but, it, yeah. you know, it, was. he was, it wasn't nice and he wasn't fun to be around at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, that totally changed when we joined Shifts. I love that. <laughs> Something I love that. had to change. It was yeah. just, we're going to do this. We're yeah. going to switch it. Mm. Um, wow. I love that. I, I love, and obviously, obviously we'll go into your success in a second in your business, but I love the, the, the relationship dynamic. There's a quote I once read that a man's loyalty is tested when he has everything. Yeah. Right. But a woman's loyalty is tested when the man has nothing. And I love that because uh, unfortunately in today's day and age, we all know how high the divorce rate is, et cetera. And you just going through that and, you know, you working well in business, again, we'll go into that in a second, but going through that, because I didn't know that story, working through that is, I just imagine it's going to just, you know, it's going to be a blip in your history. And I, th I think it's amazing. So well done, guys. Um, so business. Now you joined Shift Success um, with pretty much, you know, not really an idea in mind, but then you put your heads together working with the team to think about potential business ideas. And uh, we're not going to talk about the business you're doing now. We're going to first talk about the business you initially started. Um, <laughs> do you want to mention to everyone what that business idea was, first of all? Uh, yeah. So like you said, we joined, we had no idea, no inkling. Um, I had never even thought about going into business, didn't really think I was good at anything. I had no skills as such. Um, so yeah, we banged our heads together and come up with virtual assistants. 
Um, and that was probably my idea, to be honest, because that's so <laughs> what I'm used to. I'm used to admin, I'm used to office work. And I just thought, how can I utilize what skills I do have? Mm. work from home um so yeah we decided to go into that um david's a bit of a tech geek anyway he loves all his gadgets so i thought he would be good at doing that side of it and um yeah loves being on the computer and things like that so we decided to go with virtual assistants cool and, and you know that makes sense obviously you know you, you even talked to me and the team and you know it was a solid idea but and in fact you actually started making sales you made money from it which is amazing yeah, yeah. And this is going to be a benefit. And I think sometimes when people aren't in business, they might see this as a negative, but it's obviously not. We know this because we're going to talk about your success in a second. But you decided to pivot that idea. And yeah. what were your reasons for that? What was it like? Um, were you enjoying it or something else? There were several reasons, really. You weren't enjoying it at all, were you? Uh, yeah. So for me, I even when we first started, I was enjoying so. Like Stacey said, she would handle all the admin side of things and working with customers, doing all their emails and stuff. And then I would be more social media side, designing posts and, and doing that side of it, which I enjoy doing. However, I always had that underlying gut feeling that this wasn't the one, if you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, yeah. We were enjoying it. And yeah, it was making a good couple of grand a month. I think we were taking in about 1,500, two grand a month in good months. But yep. it, I just always had that that horrible gut feeling where this isn't the one and we're sort of like clutching at straws to keep this going and a massive one for me was we were putting so much work into it every single yeah. day to run yeah. other people's businesses yes it was getting then massively neglected <laughs> we wouldn't even advertise ours so mm. we were never we were always at a stalemate so for yeah. me I just had that gut feeling it was never but stays yeah. that's like your intuition speaking right you knew there's something yeah. else out there yeah. that you can do yeah. and yeah and that, and that makes complete sense so the benefit what i'm talking about is that you know, a lot of people that go, and I mentioned this, we ran a masterclass the other day and we had quite a few people on. And one of the things I said is that so many people like focus on the perfect idea, right? I've got, I've got to pick this perfect idea and it's got to be right. Guys, this is business and you can be as flexible as you want. And you, if you want to pivot ideas, you want to change, you want to go into a different niche, you can do anything. It's nothing like having a job, right? So if anyone watching and, you know, again, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but if you're in business and you want and you start making money from your first business or you start doing it and you figure out, you know what, I do want to change because I'm not really liking this as much. Great. You get to do that. And we've had a few of our members in the past. Mark Walsh comes to mind, a few others who have started a business idea and gone, actually, I prefer this and, and, and got a massive success, which uh, now you guys are getting. So, yeah, it's a great thing that you did. And now you are the amazing founders of a fantastic company. Is it Celtic Box? Celtic. Yeah, I don't want to get it Celtic or Celtic. <laughs> Celtic, Celtic. Doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, for those who don't know, do you want to explain what that business is? Go on. Okay, so we are a dog training company that work online and in person, and we are particularly niched to the staffy breed, although we work with bullies and stuff, but we are predominantly staffy breed, um, and we work on mentorship and accountability for staffy owners. Amazing. Oh, amazingly said. So <laughs> so with regards to staffy owners, why staffies, first of all? Why why staffy owners? We've got two staffies ourselves. Um and like we love training them. David is absolutely brilliant at training them. Um so yeah, he's he's always been hands-on with dogs. I mean, we've always had dogs. Um and it's something he's really passionate about anyway. Yeah. Um, and when we decided to pivot, we thought why not do that? Why not put everything into dog training? Yep. So yeah. we did. And with Thanks. Staffy, for me, um, obviously having Staffies is a massive plus anyway. Um, mm. But again, going, touching on the police, in the police, obviously we are dealing with dangerous dogs, etc. Okay, most of them, as we know, XL bullies and that sort of line of, of breed. Seeing them with irresponsible owners just give mm. me that drive to change the whole mentality of the breed and I for one can speak personally I've got a scar on my leg where I was bitten quite badly by a staffy at a call so if anyone's going to hate staffies it's going to be me but in yeah. fact, that gave me the absolute reason to say these are not a bad breed they are just owned by bad people um, so within our group um, we just massively push the positivity of the breed to show that they aren't what the public perceive them to be or the media perceive them to be 
it is frankly just the owners that are training these individual dogs to be the way they are, not the breed. There's never anger from a breed. Yeah, I love that. And it's a great mission that you guys have there. Um, because you're right in what you're saying, you know, I've I've seen a few people, you know, walking around uh the typical chav with yeah. the, the the gold or the silver chain around his uh staffy and you know you just you just got that look right and you're seeing a lot of music videos as well like you know the grime videos and stuff like that and it gives that perception right but yeah. my family have had staffies for years and they're the most gorgeous dogs ever right so i think i think you are right in what you're doing i think that perception does need to change because unfortunately the breed could get a bad name so a fantastic mission um and, and just because to make everyone clear, you weren't dog trainers before you started this business, were you? You didn't have any experience no, no. in doing it. Love that. No, it's just a personal um, personal thing. Like, mm. you've always been into yeah. training hours. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just a personal yeah. thing, the passion. Yeah. Amazing. And that's a common thing. You know, we've got a few dog trainers inside Shift Success. Obviously, you've worked in the job for many years. You're not going to have the experience, right? You actually learn whilst you're doing it, um, which you guys have done. So... Talk about staffy owners and and their situation. What are kind of some of the common problems? Because you've got your your group. It's called Staffy Training and Help. Is that right? Staffy Training and Help. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's group phenomenally like two is two and a half thousand at the minute over the past few months. Yeah, yeah so it's like we, three months. Yeah. Isn't so it? We started about three months ago, and we've we've had approximately eighty eight hundred and thirty members new a month for the three months. So wow, can't complain. <laughs> That's absolutely amazing. We'll go on to that in a second. But yeah. with regards to the the Safis, like what kind of problems do you find people are reaching out to, who need to help with? Um, there's loads, really, isn't there? But the the top one is reactivity. Um, but as we've learned, that's quite common in the breed because they were bred for dog fighting. So reactivity to other dogs is massive. Right. Um, but there's loads of all there's loads of different problems, loads of different owners. Um, there's separation anxiety and yeah. little behavior problems. It, it it can range from something quite severe, yeah, to something minuscule, but it all depends on the pain points really for the customer as to so it's yeah. unique, basically. Like it could be, what the customer A could have this going on, customer B could have something completely. Is there any common themes that you've spotted that people are making mistakes with their staffies? Like you're thinking, because because a lot of the people think it's the dog, but as yeah. you quite rightly said, David, it's like it's the owners who are teaching the dogs about things. So have you spotted any commonalities there? And just the owner. <laughs> yeah. So the way we sort of to work our training and I make it clear on all our calls with customers I say you know I've got no magic recipe I've got no magic wand I'm quite aware that there's a lot of free dog training advice out there however that's not what we try and sell I sell myself so I'm selling the mentorship and accountability I will work with uh, an owner one-to-one -one. I will teach them what they need to know to train that staffy um, and we go through all their plans and everything, all their lifestyle. And we often find that there is certain triggers that they are doing, which is causing that behavior. You won't get that from watching a video on YouTube. So that's yeah. what we try and sell. It's just that mentorship and accountability. It's very much a mixed bag. We get customers that come on board with us who haven't even got a staffy yet and know they're getting a puppy. So they can come on board. They have some mentorship. They can set that house up ready for the puppy come in, get everything in place and just give them the best start. Others, we have rescue staffies that are obviously in quite a bad way, reactivity-wise, very aggressive. We've had um, issues where physical bites have happened, and we've got to really work with that client then to work out what is triggering that dog to cause them to be so aggressive. Yeah. So, yeah, like Stay said, it is a massive mixed bag, but we focus more on training the owner than the staffy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> and obviously that helps with the online element because obviously you're an online business as well as an, an in-person business. And as you know, there's staffies all around the UK, right? So would you say like it's a 50-50 split or would you say actually there's 80-20 split with people being online compared to in-person? How would you? I can even say it's 80-20. It's probably 90% yeah. online. Yeah. yeah. Wow. We've got a couple of clients which are local. Mm. Um, but I actually prefer the online stuff. Yeah. Um, we're speaking to people in Australia. There's people in America. Wow. Uh, they wow. are literally all over the world. Right. So it's great to speak to people, not even in this country, you know, is it absolutely everywhere? It is phenomenal. So for those who don't know, I don't think I've mentioned this, but you've only been doing this business for the past three and a half months, maybe? 
Yes. Yeah, we started mid October, I think it was, where we actually started launching everything. So, so mid October, you started this business. You now have got global reach. You've got a Facebook group of two and a half thousand, and not only that, but your actual sales are over five and a half thousand pound now, which is insane. Um, <laughs> and more importantly than that is that I've actually seen your clients and your reviews, and they love you guys. They they think you're amazing. You're solving meaningful problems like your story is amazing but what do you think set you apart from other dog trainers out there because the feedback you've got from your customers is exceptional what what do you think it is what's your secret sauce do you think the feedback that we're getting from everyone really because i take the audition calls um mm. and i you know one of my questions is why yes and mm. we're receiving loads of feedback it's because it's we're staffy specific mm. um, so they feel as though we understand the breed Mm. Um, which we do we've done loads of research we have staffies ourselves and like we've already discussed is a massive stigma which staffy owners want to eradicate um mm. so that's the main reason i think people are coming to us and what sets us apart um because there are behaviors that are specific to the breed as well yeah um which they feel that we understand amazing absolutely lovely um so your facebook group obviously that's uh you know it's getting big and but what we'll do we we'll drop the comments in for people who are watching the facebook group and we'll put it in the show notes as well um but uh what's kind of one of the reasons you know for your group building so fast i know you're very good at content creation your own content i'm seeing you on tiktok and uh, youtube and stuff like that is that one of the reasons or is there something else that you guys are doing as a part of the strategy um, so for me, I was I was sort of in a bit of a turmoil when we started the group as to how much we sort of give away for free. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've tend to find is it's not so much that it stops customers coming to us. I think if anything, it adds value. So I'm quite open with what I put in. Um, I don't try and push people down the sales route. I make it quite clear. I know what I'm talking about. And if you need my help, I'm there. Okay, I'll give as much free advice as I can. Um, there is definitely issues that I cannot deal with within the group so i will then obviously say to people you need to come on mentorship when it's aggression there's bites and stuff facebook comments is just not adequate um yep. so that side of it we've just promoted in within our group um but obviously we're members of a lot of staffy groups and a lot of the staffy groups is just positivity they're not really training based um so if i'm in there and i can see someone has got a training issue i will put a comment on it and just say this is what i would recommend or try this try that um, but then I'll just chuck the tag in and say, look, if you want more advice, we've got 20 plus free guides in our group, all accessible for members. Come and jump on in. Um, and what you tend to find is people will see that thread and you'll get six or seven people joining that way. Wow. Um, and again, TikTok, YouTube, where Stacey does the audition calls, one of our first questions is why have you chosen Celtic Barks as opposed to any other dog trainer? 90% of them will say, oh, I've seen you on social media. I've seen your videos. You've really helped with stuff already. Um, so I just need more help on other issues um, and your staff specific. So obviously, out of the choice of another dog trainer that deals with all breeds, they're going to come with us because we deal with staffies. And and again, like Stace touched on, um, most breeds haven't got the negativity staffies have. So they're already doing well for themselves as a breed, if you know what I mean, where staffies need that positivity and they as much as I hate saying it on my own videos, we we need to be more accountable as staffy owners. Mm. If a staffy runs over to someone and nips a dog, the outcome for that staffy is probably going to be 10 times worse had that not been a cocker spaniel. So we yeah. just need to be mindful of that. And that's something I do really push, that training is probably more important if you own a staffy than it is a chihuahua. Um, so again, it's just driving that point home, really, um, which I hate to say because it shouldn't be the case, but we reality strikes that it is that makes so much sense that it makes so much that's almost like a i know this is not a thing but like dog racism it's like it's yeah. like you know it's like a stigma we've got with the breed that obviously yeah i completely get that makes sense so so guys like you know you've gone and started this business you know you've pivoted you're making money from your first business you decided that's not for you um and then you've gone into this business you've been doing this you know three and a half and a bit months you're making, you know, over five and a half grand sales per month at the minute. You've got global reach, massive Facebook group. What, and you know, a lot of people watching this or listening to this will, and they're police officers and they, and they, or in the police and they want change, but they've got these doubts, insecurities. I'm just a cop, you know, that's all I've ever known. I'm feeling institutionalized. And, you know, they just, they, they want to get out, but they just don't believe in themselves. 
what advice would you give? Like what skill sets have you brought from the police into this business? You know, and what advice would you give from a mindset perspective to help anyone listening, you know, to help that transition? My advice is do it. Absolutely. <laughs> just do it. That's, yeah. that's the only advice that I can give. Um, once you start believing in yourself, like initially, like I said, I didn't believe I had any skill set at all. I've got a few GCSEs. That's it, really. A couple of I haven't, I haven't got any degrees or anything like that. And I just you thought do. I've worked in an office. What skills do I have? Absolutely nothing. Believe in yourself. You do have skills. There are definitely transferable skills. Um, we've got different roles within our business. Um, my skills are brought into my role in the business. Um, which is sort of admin side of things, you know, onboarding and things like that. Mm. Um, so David's skill set is different to mine, but my advice would just be absolutely go for it. Love that. Best thing love, you love the positivity. <laughs> and David, um, what would you say? For me, it's probably twofold. So for me, first of all, was identifying that I've gone into the job as a police with a plan on doing 30 years. I knew Oh, I had to realize that that wasn't going to be the case. So one, it was a mindset change. I think my ego was definitely playing a big part thinking if I come out the police after seven, 10, 15 years, I failed myself because I went in with the intention to do 30 and I haven't, I'm a failure. As soon as that mindset was gone, that changed my outlook on everything. So that's probably what is holding some people back. I guarantee it. Um, and secondly, for me, I kept putting it off. Oh, I can't afford a business. Oh, I'm thick as mud because I did nothing in school. I was rubbish. No GCSEs. Never be able to run a business. I'll never be successful. It's pointless wasting money. Or I haven't got the money to put into it. But then I'll go and buy myself a new phone. or go and buy, myself, my, buy myself an Apple Watch. So although I make the excuse I had no money to start, I could quite happily go and spend two, £300 on something else that mm. didn't give me any financial benefit whatsoever. Um, so again, for me personally, it's just a mindset. Um, once you start even making small headway, and even if it's something as little as registering your company and making a logo, that will give you such a rocket up your backside. It will drive you to do the rest. And that was mm -hmm. what we did. We just took it in small steps. We weren't expecting to make the progress we have in the three months. So the fact we have has been obviously amazing, but we weren't even expecting that. We would have been happy with a thousand pound sales a month. Um, but the fact we've reached what we have, it, it just keeps driving you. Honestly, like Stay said, just do it. If you've got any doubts, try it. If it doesn't work, then you can at least say, like I said, we've tried it, it didn't work. And there's no, you never are left with that what if feeling in the back of your mind, which is the main driving factor. I used to sit there and say, oh, I'll never do it. I'll never do it. I'll never do it. Or I need to change. Now I've done it. If it hadn't worked, I can say, well, I tried. I've explored that avenue and it didn't work. Okay. Um, so I would just say, try it. At least if it doesn't work, you can rule it out and say you've given it a good go rather than just sit there for the next 10 years unhappy thinking, I wish I tried it or what if I had tried it, what would be different now? And that's basically it for me. <laughs> can I take what you just said <laughs> and just want to take that from your brain and put that into every single unhappy police officer? Because that, <laughs> you know, amazing what you just said there. It's, that's going to be so helpful to people listening who have been in a similar situation. And, you know, I said this on the, uh, the mass class the other night is that unfortunately people would rather choose certain misery than the uncertainty. But for you to get from where you are, which is unhappiness to a happy life, you have to make that trip through a place called uncertainty. And for you with that positive mindset, you've got obviously both of you, and that's probably why you work so well as well is uh is you know is why you're making it it's why you're making a success of yourself and you know i've said this to you plenty of times but you should be extremely proud of yourselves i know this is just like three months and you're already here but yeah. like your future is going to be absolutely insane i want to talk about you know you mentioned like your roles there stacy yeah that was a great question that i kind of uh you know wanted to ask like working in a relationship like how does because we've got a few couples inside shift success and they've, they've smashed it you know we've had lauren jack on the podcast we've had you know bill and emma uh, and a few others uh, and i work you know with with my fiance in, in business and i want to ask you and you know share as much as you like here but how do you separate business from relationship time do, do you like do you, do you put that in your calendar or what tips yeah. can you share 
yeah. we absolutely live by our calendar. Right. So we we do make time for ourselves. We make yeah. sure that we plan date nights. We've got uh, time with the kids and um, things like that. But everything goes on our calendar. We do a shared calendar. We literally abide by that. That is our Bible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think having the different roles within the business helps as well. We initially started off um, sort of agreeing that he, David would take some customers and I'd take some customers as trainers, mm-hmm. um, which didn't really work because then we were, we were missing uh, certain things. So like David wouldn't get his contract done on time for a customer or I wouldn't set up a payment to go out for my customer. And it was getting so stressful mm. that we decided that David can talk and loves being on camera. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> as you can see. So he's way better suited to that. Um, so he's the main trainer for the business now. And I do everything admin related um, and take the initial audition calls as well. Um, but that works way better for us. So from a working relationship perspective, you know, I know that I can rely on him. Uh, yesterday for instance we had a, a webinar that was sold out um david did all of that and he was br- absolutely brilliant for two hours um and then i helped with the slideshow um and then taking the payments and setting all that side of things up and it just works so much better for us yeah um, but it personally i was so our personal lives um because we live together as well it, it's nice in the evening to sit down um you know we can talk about what customers or whatever we've dealt with during that day um but we do definitely make time to go out and we um go on on dates i think that's really still important that we Um, do make time sometimes i have to tell him off because he's on his phone replying to the customers (laughs) like come on let's just what get through an hour you know (laughs) i I think like stacy touched on i think it's just communication so before we started this journey with celtic barks within the first couple of weeks obviously like Stacey said we fell into pitfalls where we were trying to both do everything as mm-hmm. soon as we split roles it was a lot better um but we could see that obviously it was picking up a lot faster than we were expecting so we sort of had that mature discussion and said look you know it's natural the relationship is going to have some sort of effect you know yep. we're not going to see each other as much or we're going to be busy um but yeah like Stacey said it's just making that time and having that mature conversation and say right we are absolutely hectic for two weeks so at the end of this two weeks we are going to book a weekend away or we're going to make sure we go on a date night or you know it's just little things like we've signed up to cine world and we we are customers so you can go to the cinema now for free because you pay a monthly membership so if we're sat at home one day and we've got three hours spare we'll go and jump in and watch a film together or something as simple as that just making time out on the calendar and, and that's the massive one i would say for any couples going into business make time for yourselves absolutely so you don't get burned out and also have separate roles and don't try and do everything both of you together That's, that would be my two biggest bits of advice for a couple great great bit of advice absolutely amazing it's good because obviously there's there's a lot of people where they, if they're business 100 percent all the time then obviously like you said the relationship can suffer so making time for you just you two is yeah. you know really important and obviously you know, you're on this journey together and yeah, the odd conversation about business will drop in. It does for me and my, you know, me and Sophie, um, but you kind of rein in, you know, you're self-aware of it at least, right? Um, Not only that, sorry, it's yeah. the fact that we can get to share it together. So we've yeah. had a, a win or, you know, the customer, a new customer yeah. has come on board or something exciting has happened. We get to share that together, which I absolutely love. So it's yeah. not just not talking about it. We absolutely love talking about it. Yeah. It's all we yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I think it's just that we just, I think the biggest problem is neither of us switch off. We'll be sat watching TV on the sofa. <laughs> we won't speak for 30 minutes because we're watching a program. And we'll both turn in the adverts and be like, I was thinking this. And then she'd be like, so was I. Like, do you really? <laughs> but, and, and again, like we know it's going to have a massive impact, but like we've discussed, you know, it's, it's, it's looking for that end goal. We if we have yeah. to suffer a little bit now and see each other a little bit less, or yeah. if we're in different rooms on laptops, so be it. Because it's going to be worthwhile when we yeah. hopefully yeah. get to where we want to be. You're building a future, right? It's like short term sacrifice, long term gain. But when you both enjoy it, like you say, you're high fiving, you've just made another sale, or you know you've got a bit of an issue. It's good to like vent off each other as well, and you know, sh- like you said, share the celebration. So yeah, I think it's a, it's an amazing, amazing thing, and. Uh, Power couples, I think they're, they're going to be a, a very popular trend, I feel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, guys, you mentioned roles. So, 
Um, Stacey, I'm, uh, so I'm guessing like your uh, operations admin, maybe on the finance side as well. And then with David, you're like kind of marketing and, you know, sales, obviously, as well with you, Stacey, there's kind of, you've, you've kind of figured that out. And would you say that's because, you know, that's your strength, David, and that's your strength, Stacey? Yeah, I hate being on camera. I absolutely <laughs> hate it. I just can't. I know I've had a talk on myself, trust me. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I don't know whether it's I can't explain myself or I doubt myself. You know, everyone's got their strengths <laughs> and weaknesses. If, if totally pushed, I could do it, but it's not something I enjoy doing. Yeah. And David really enjoys it. He wants to be hands on. He loves explaining things and meeting people and the social element. So it just made sense yeah. to do it. And it's I think working. what Dave said, yeah, it was just, we just naturally fell into the roles. Like, I think one thing that every cop can do or I'd like to think can do is speak to people. You know, me doing it on a webcam isn't half as intimidating as doing it to someone who's at the worst point of their life or they're most aggressive and I've still been able to talk. So that's just one thing that doesn't really faze me. Um, and that has probably come from the military. Like I used to say to Stace, I was massively underconfident, didn't have a good experience in school. Um, mm -hmm. Before joining the military, if I had a conversation with someone, I wouldn't even make eye contact with them. I'd look at the floor. I was that underconfident. The wow. military really did push me out my comfort zone and in that four year five year transition made massive impacts on the rest of my life confidence wise so now I'm quite comfortable of doing it and likewise like Stay said I absolutely despise doing anything admin related I hate it in the <laughs> job I hate it doing it in the business if I got to send an email it's a bad day for me so I hate <laughs> it but Stace loves all that. That was proven in our first business endeavor. Okay, it was more suited to her. Um, and she loves doing all of that. I'm quite happy to do all the sales calls and everything. And that's how it's, we just naturally fall in. And it works so much better. Like I said, we fell into the pitfall of almost trying to do everything separated at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it quickly become apparent that it was never going to be we're never going to work or we'll never have any longevity in it and i think the best move that we've done in the whole three months yeah. is change roles or separate roles absolutely i love that i love that it's like you've got your own responsibilities as well it's like you're not checking on each other all the time because you know david you've got that covered yeah, yeah. stacy you've got that covered and yeah. sometimes when there's not that communication and like you said when you initially started you might be standing on each other's toes because you're like oh i'm trying to do this and you're trying to do this but now yeah. you've got a system by the sounds of it which is cool yeah, absolutely so you're definitely made for each other. Like that is just very, <laughs> very clear. Um, so we've talked about your success, you know, you're building your Facebook group, you're getting your name out there, you know, you've got thousands of people following you. Um, your sales are, you know, going through the roof, you know, five and a half plus in only three months now. And obviously with that being said, it's a service-based business. So your profit margins are high, but I want to talk about, you know, so I know some of you, you know, the challenges cause I'm, you know, one of your mentors, but do you want to share some of the challenges that you've had with the business uh, starting initially? Um, so, well, just touching on that, not obviously having clear guidance of roles before we started out. Um, I think it's probably, again, just being aware of burnout. So I'm obviously with, so the way our Facebook group works is if someone comes in and wants some training advice, they have to post a comment and I have to approve that comment. So I think the pitfall is probably doing too much where I'm still probably replying to training questions at 11, 12 at night, wow. when I really should be more strict to myself and go, mm -hmm. if this was a your nine to five, my manager wouldn't be expecting me to be still doing stuff at midnight. No. So it's probably having a bit of discipline myself. Yeah, However, yeah, I am conscious we're in the early days and that will probably progress and I will probably get a bit stricter. Um, but I think my biggest downfall is is just loving working with dogs. And I think that passion. is, what stops me. yeah, it's just having that passion <laughs> where I'm just like, for me, it's not work. Talking about dogs at 12 o'clock at night isn't work when yeah. Stace is sitting there with <laughs> the rolling pin scenario. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Get off yeah, it, she might say a bit different. But yeah, so for me, one of the pitfalls is just being more disciplined and saying, right, come on, it's eight o'clock at night now you need to switch off and, and put it to one side. And I almost like guilt trip myself thinking, well, this person's put a comment on the group at eight o'clock that they need their reply. Do you mean they can't wait until yeah. the morning, but yeah. just realizing that they probably don't even expect me to reply at that time of night. It's probably yeah. ready for the morning, but yeah. That's that's, you put on that's, yourself. That that's de yeah. That's definitely one for myself. If nothing yeah. else. I've yeah. been there. Yeah. 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 But I think because we share it, it's kind of our baby together. So it's, yeah. I understand but I do think 
that we you know like we like I said we do spend time with each other and but yeah it is just switching off um but I do understand because it is our baby so yeah you, you like you're not gonna like I say this to people like if you're passionate about something yeah like you're, you're gonna talk about it you're gonna want to do it all the time you're not gonna say to a parent you shouldn't be playing with your kids that too much. Yeah, too much. Exactly. You shouldn't feed your kids that, you know, because you, you love your child, you love your baby, right? You're going to want to, you know, cuddle it and play with it all the time. Same thing with business. So I think you're right in what you're saying. Like you do it as much as you want to do it. But if it comes at a detriment or something, which is, you know, mm -hmm. your mental health or burnout or your relationship, then of course, then you put a system in place to obviously deal with that. And the way you're scaling, guys, I imagine you're going to have an admin team who is going to oh, be... Oh, yeah. yeah. We're going to need it soon. I'm yeah. struggling. I'm drowning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like we say, like having to get an accountant on board to do our yeah. finances, although, yeah, that is a cost to us, I still consider that a win um, because we've never needed an accountant before because we weren't financially earning as much. So although that is a negative because it's an expenditure for me, that is a win all day. Essentially, they're going to save us money because, yeah, of course, yeah. you know, yeah, absolutely. Just, I just don't know what we can. I don't, I'm not an accountant. I don't know <laughs> yeah. anything really about what we can claim, and so it's, it's going to save us in the long run. It really is, Stacey. You're right in what you're saying. Accountants don't. A good accountant, should I say, does not. Cost, so I've unfortunately had when I first started business a bad accountant. Now, thankfully, for the past few years, I've had a great accountant. But you know, sometimes. Um, you know what it should happen is that accountants actually save you money they don't cost you money like yes they've got to charge their service but the amount you're getting back and the strategies you can do is insane especially if they know the stuff so you're right in what you're saying and um it's needed it's, it's really needed another one is a win which people don't realize but when you make your first profit and you've got to pay a bit of corporation tax like people will look at that as go oh i've got to pay a bit of tax you're in profit. You've got a profitable business, right? That's a good, good thing. Or when you get your tax-free dividends through, again, that that's a massive win. So, yeah, I, I, you're in the right mind. I just I love your mindset and what you're thinking. What's been some of your biggest lessons so far in business that you can share with people? Oh God. Um, again, I think it's just going back to me, like instantly. Obviously, within the three months, and this isn't a brag, we haven't hit many pitfalls, which I'm thankful for. But I think, yeah, I, like I've, we've already touched on, I think our biggest pitfall was being very naive that both of us can handle the whole business on our own and not separate roles. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what we learned from the last business, just touching on it, is every penny that came in, we sort of had the wrong mindset of, it's all profit. Let's just keep it. We want that money. Let's keep it. Where yeah. this one, we're looking at money going, right, we've got two, three thousand pound in the business account that we effectively aren't using at the minute. Let's get an accountant. Let's pay people to do stuff for us. Yeah. To take the load off us, not sit there with money in the bank, not being used, but then we're drowning in work or drowning yeah. in things to do and tasks and, and not finishing our work day till 11 o'clock at night where we could pay someone to do that for us and take that burden away yeah. so for me it's just being a bit more sensible and spending to accumulate oh. yeah we're definitely doing that this time aren't we yeah. um yeah absolutely. you know there's equipment and things we're buying we've got these new microphones yeah, yeah, and yeah. got the matching hoodies fabric. as well <laughs> <of the hoodies. laughs> yeah. yeah we've done that and that's things things like that like the uniform um like yeah. you said even the tax pot so our business account and um, we've set it up so that every single payment that goes into that business account, 20% is automatically deducted and got goes into a separate tax pot. Um, so it's just having the common sense. And again, I think the pitfalls that we had with Invaluable when we first started has really given us a good stead for this business because we knew exactly what to change and what went wrong. Mm. Um, so I think, yeah, I think the pivot did us massively with good. With the business previously, we were in the mindset as well of just you know, grabbing any customer that we could. Um, mm. We don't have yeah. this one at yeah. all. The massive one. Uh, yeah, do you want to talk about that? I hope you don't mind, you know, sharing, but I think, because it's something we do, um, we, we tell all the time, um, and I think yeah. more businesses need to do it. So yeah, do you want to share, we don't say any names, obviously, but because <clears throat> it's, yeah, it's no, a no, standard you have. Just in the wrong mindset, <clears throat> I think. We were just, you know, we wanted <clears throat> to make money and, Anyone that showed any interest in the business at all, we were like, yeah, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> yeah. And it, that's not how you should be. Like with this business, yeah. we've actually turned down people because we don't think that they're right for us. Love that. Um, yeah. 
and you know they're offering money like the other day I spoke to a woman and she was like will you please take me and I, I she's just not right for us at all she'd missed a couple of calls she hadn't given us any warning um you know and it's it's that's got a financial implication for us because somebody else could have booked that time um we've scheduled an hour for her and she's just not turned up and you know we've we understand things come up or whatever. So she was given another opportunity and she did the same thing again. And, and then she's begging to for our services. And I just, it's not for us. No, uh, I, whereas previously we would have taken, we would have just gone, okay, yeah. give me your money. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no. you, you, what you say, so we do that. And uh, we, comp you know, we advise that you do, you know, as a part of your mentors, you know, we encourage you to do that because, you know, sometimes there's an interesting dynamic between customers and, and, and being in business and, you know, you're there to solve people's problems. You're there to be of service and to be helpful, right? But that doesn't mean being walked over. And sometimes, you know, unfortunately, it's not it's not nothing to be in a staffy owner. It's just that human being. So like we know generally cops are good people, right? They're good people. They protect people. They are, you know, they have integrity. But every now and then, unfortunately, which we know in the media, you'll get that one crazy cop who does something terrible, Right. In business, even though your niche or your customer base can be generally really nice, unfortunately, you will get that one red flag who comes up now and then, and they do try and walk over you a little bit. And that's where you and the business owner, and this is, you know, your experience is building, where uh, you go, actually, no, you're not a good fit for me. And the reasons are for this, and I deserve better. So like for us, if people don't turn for the second call, because we understand, you know, police officers are busy, like they don't turn for the second call without telling us, sorry, you're never going to join Shift Success. You're, you're not for us. Uh, or if there's any kind of like, um, you know, kind of uh, ghosting or anything like that. We just, we, you've got the problem. We've got the, the solution. It's like, we want to help you, but you've got to help yourself. So um, I, I love that you do that. You know, it's, it's an important thing. And I wish more people stood the ground in doing that. Um, have you got like a, sorry, Stacey? Um, I just think we genuinely want to help people with these problems um, and we want to be good at it you know we want to have good reviews and we we want to build a successful business and people like that are not for us because we don't believe they're going to put that work in which is then going to result in a negative review for us because they're yeah. not going to get the results that they want so, so true so true it's like you're thinking with the end in mind and it's yeah. important there's no point you're not thinking short-term money you're actually thinking actually lots of long-term implications which again is a great entrepreneurial mindset um, for you and, you know, you know, being in business and working with you know, different diverse customers, is there, you know, anything like, you know, um, you would look for in a customer, like a green light, like you think, tick, 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 this person, I definitely want to help. What are some of those signs for you? So for me, from the training perspective, when I'm on a call is mostly dedication. So again, just touching on mindset, I go into the calls now, um, with the mindset of I'm there to help them solve their problem. They yeah. want me, I don't need them. And that's not yeah. me being big headed, but yeah. um, we've had a couple of calls recently where people have gone, Oh, I don't know. And I've basically laid it on the line and said, look, you've got a dog that is physically biting another dog harmfully. I said, I will come off this call and carry on my day. You will come off this call and that dog will still be biting. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just to, to have that mindset of not chasing every customer. They need us. We don't need them, so to speak. But for me with the calls, the first thing I look for is dedication. So on our or my personal sales call that I do, um, the last question that I tend to ask is, why do you think you'd be a good fit for our mentorship program? Mm. And if they just burble something along the lines of, oh, I, I just want to fix my dog. Mm. Then I, it already sets a red flag off. You can tell yeah. almost within seconds of people coming on the call um, whether they're going to be a good fit because you'll just tell by their dedication. You can see the pain. We've had people crying on calls and although that's not nice, that just shows the level of dedication. And again, it reverts back to me. I wanted to make a change with my personal lifestyle and I was nearly on in tears to Stacey on my audition call. So I instantly relate to that. And I know that is someone that is going to engage and send me training videos and work with me hand in hand to get that result. If they don't show that enthusiasm, then like I make it quite clear to them, I can only take so many people on um, because I want to keep that one-to-one. -one. And if I take too many clients on, I can't. So then sadly they'll get refused if they don't show that level of dedication. 
love that makes absolute sense makes absolute sense like for us like we we have an application process so we will we, we'll, you know we'll put out in our groups or something guys we're launching the next intake then we have an application process and that application process we've got a scoring mechanism and you know some unfortunately there's cops who are going to be listening to this and watching this but some some guys you want to build a successful business right you want to live amongst the one percent but you're scoring yourself a six or seven when it comes to how driven you are in wanting this like that's just not going to happen so that's when we say to people look unless this is a typo or a mistake you're not going to be for us we want to help those people who are determined to change their lives because the last thing you want, like you said, like is work with someone who is not putting their all in. That's why we do what we do, right? To help people get to that. But we can't do the work for them. We've got to, you know, we don't want to be motivating people all the time. They've got to have that that kind of drive to want a better life. So what you're saying there, again, is is making perfect sense. And again, I wish more people did it. Um, for you guys and your future in business, where do you see this, you know, your business going? You know, you've always mentioned you, you're speaking to people in Australia and different countries now, but where do you see this baby going? We were talking about this yesterday, where yeah. we actually yeah. Yeah. about how we're going to grow it. Um, I don't, I don't really know. Like, I we discussed maybe um, sort of training other trainers. Yeah. Um, you know, as under a Celtic box branch so we've yeah. got other trainers all around the country or the world or whatever i mean that's a long time off at the moment but um we discussed that what else yeah we personally for me it's it's just getting that positivity out there it mm. absolutely pains me sometimes when i'm walking my two dogs and people will actively cross the street mm. it, mm. it literally pains me because i just want to call that person over and go have a fuss with helga she'll lick you to death boris will lick you to death okay mm. Um, there's not a bad bone in their body. All right, yes, they could be reactive to other dogs, but that's normally dependent on how the other dog reacts. But when people are genuinely scared of those two dogs, it absolutely pains me because they are missing out on that social interaction because people have already got that horrible misconception. Yeah. So for me, even if we never made another penny in this business, but everyone in the world understood just how amazing staffies are, mm. that would be a win for me. Obviously, oh, the financial side of it would be amazing. Don't get me wrong, because I yeah. want to be independent. And the more I can be independent from the police, the more I can drive that positivity. So that is obviously a factor. But for me, when I started this and came into it, it the main driving factor wasn't financials. It was, please, 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 just rethink how you think about these breeds because they're not called nanny dogs that look after kids for nothing. You wouldn't yeah. put a vicious dog with a child. And it honestly, it just pains me when I see people cross the street and stuff and it shouldn't happen. If I was a Cocker Spaniel, you'd walk on by and not give it a second glance. And there's no reason why a staff, he should be any different. I love that. I absolutely love that. And Monia's put in the um, chat there, bless you for being, uh, for being responsible dog owners. I admit that uh, I cross the street because I don't trust the owners. So yeah. what you're saying is spot on. It's not so much the dogs, but it's the owners that give the dogs a bad perception. Yeah. Right? yeah. And that's why we're so strict with our sales calls, because in the back of my mind, if I know someone is not going to engage or be a bit of a time waster, instantly in the back of my mind, I'm thinking you are taking the slot of someone who is potentially going to change their dog's life and yeah effectively change the positivity if you're not going to do it that's fine there's nothing i can do about your mentality but however i'm not going to let you deprive someone else of that who is willing to do that so that is always like a massive factor in my brain when i'm doing the sales calls and that's why i am quite strict and people might say i'm obnoxious and very picky and i probably am but it's because of the reason why i'm doing it it's not because i think i'm better than them i think it's admirable for you to stand by your values with regards to the vision for your uh, business, but also the vision you have for that breed. And and that comes through incredibly passionate. And I'm not saying this because I'm biased because, you know, I, I know you guys and we work with you and we help you, but that I've not heard you say that before, David. And uh, that came through pa pure passion. It's amazing. And that's, you know, it's, it's really nice to see because not everyone asks, but I'm not passionate about all my businesses, right? Even though you get results, but when you've got passion and a business, great, fantastic. And that just came through. So amazing. Um, guys, where can people get to know more about you? Where can they find you? Where can they stalk you? <laughs> just about everywhere, I think. Yeah. So we got loads of socials. Um, so our Facebook group is Staffy Training Help. 
um that's pri primarily where we put yeah. content but there's um tiktok instagram youtube uh celticbox.com is the website um which david's built <laughs> yeah. i'm really proud of that <laughs> um there's loads on there but yeah staffy, but staffy training help is the main go-to that's where if people are on are watching this and have got staffies there is a wealth of free information i'm on hand in the group um to give advice and like i said if you need to make that change with your staffy then obviously you can come on board you can book in a call with stace and we'll get you through that process um, and then we can give some one-to-one -one mentorship all our customers have a private whatsapp group with me um, so they will have mentorship every single day, 24-7. If I'm available, I'm there answering it. Um, and that is around their personal one-to-one -one calls with me on Zoom, as well as all the other added bonuses of being a paid customer. But they will have the accountability and mentorship, and I'll be checking in with them to say, right, I've set you homework. Why haven't you done it? I want no excuses. It's to be done. It's as simple as that. You're paying me, and I'm telling you, you are doing it. So, um, again... You don't get that from watching videos on YouTube, unfortunately. So that yeah. is our big selling point. Makes makes absolute sense. Perfect. Absolutely spot on, guys. You've got Spencer here in the chat who's just said, don't be so sure that your business won't spread beyond the UK that quickly. I'm British, but watching from Colorado right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, you're spreading, you're spreading <laughs> everywhere. And, and like I say, you know, already you're speaking to people in different countries and this has been going for three months. Guys, look, I just want to say that seeing you guys join shift success sit you know speaking to stacy so we've got a stacy too guys if you're wondering so <laughs> yeah stacy on our, on our team speaking to stacy getting emotional on that call making a decision to better your life just you know despite you being in debt and, and overcoming that and having some you know issues around that and wanting a better life for you know yourself your your family is amazing you've gone from literally starting a business making money pivoting starting a new idea and then within three months you've got global reach thousands of people following you you're making over five and a half grand a month which is just a fraction to where you're going to go i know that um and obviously more importantly you're making a massive huge positive difference you're solving meaningful problems and you know i'm proud i know the team's proud of you you should be proud of yourself and uh, i know this is just the start of your journey uh guys thank you so much i do want to finish with one last question though and that question is for you first, Stacey, what does entrepreneurship mean to you? Oh, my God. What a question. <laughs> I already know my answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know, really. I just think having faith in yourself, like, that's that's where I've come. I, I've done having faith in what I'm doing um, and knowing that my skill set can be utilized in what I'm doing um yeah just having that belief i honestly think it's a belief um being an entrepreneur is literally having that belief in yourself love that, That's what love, it means that. For me. <laughs> I love it it's needed it's very true i love it and david um for me it's just freedom and security that's what it means to me being able to pick when i work what type of work i do um and having that freedom to like i said without pushing it just to, to have time to spread that positivity and do as much as I can for the breed. But secondly, security, God forbid, if anything happened to me, security for Stace, for Dylan, Stace's girls, knowing that I've left something for them because, all right, the police pension might be brilliant. I'll probably never get to the age where I'm ever going to use it anyway. I'm not even paying into it at the moment because I, I, I my money is better spent elsewhere. Um, but yeah, just freedom for me, the family and security for them should worst case scenario because we don't know what's around the corner. Wow. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. Guys, again, incredibly proud of you. Thank you so much for your time today. For those who are watching uh, on the Facebook group, this is going to be left inside the group. Um, we will get a link or Dave and Stacey, you can drop the link to your group in case anyone's got staffies and they need any help with them. Um, for those who are just tuning in, please do watch this interview back. It's incredibly inspiring. It's incredibly motivating to see where these guys have come from to where they are now. And for those who are listening on the podcast, please do check out the uh, show notes because we'll leave the links for uh, their business below so you can give them a good stock. Guys, thank you so much. For everyone, thank you for tuning in. And uh, yeah. Out. We'll catch up soon. Can I can I just say one thing before I leave, guys? If anyone has got any doubt in whether to follow this process, 
please just do it. I can't, I can't say enough. I'm <laughs> starting to get emotional now just thinking of it. Okay, but please just do it. It will literally change your life. Okay. I, I'm the most skeptical person ever. Okay. And I was very skeptical to begin with because I'm always the same of if I see people leave reviews or oh, he's got them to do that, he's paid them to do it. I can promise you now we are getting no incentive other than our own promotion on this. Okay. And Alex is as genuine as they come. Okay. If you are thinking about doing it, just do it. I promise you it will be life changing. And I'll just shut up now. <laughs> You're going to make me cry in a second. <laughs> Th thank you guys that i really appreciate that guys thank you everyone for tuning in um we'll catch you up soon and uh yeah amazing story guys and uh thank you so much. wish you all the best thank you thank you bye bye <laughs>